Okay, I've never met Devin Hester. I've dreamed about meeting Devin Hester, so here's the deal. <laughs> Unless my producers are cruel, hard-hearted people, I'm being led to believe that Devin Hester might come on the show today. What? I can't even believe it. If you have questions for him, please hit me up. Also, our training camp tour stops, asterisk, tentative, uh, will be revealed today. We're gonna say where we're going. We're going to the East Coast. It just was easier. We'll see what we can do on the West Coast. We also have Nick Cosmider from The Athletic on the Broncos, which is just, you know, another day in paradise over there. Max, uh, Matt Schneidman, our old friend with The Athletic covering the Packers side of things. And we start the show with Burr. No! Burrow is is has a chance to do it all this year and I, and and let me just tell you why Joe Burrow walks into this season healthy 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 really really just when we get our guy, Chris Collinsworth, to get these Cincy fans all excited, we have an injury to the quarterback who was set to start the season healthy for the very first time. Ugh! I can't believe it. Zach Taylor, here's the deal. He's calling it a calf injury. Let's get you uh, caught up on this. It was while rolling out during practice. Everyone saw it. We still don't know the extent or a timeline as you're seeing it here. Now there are reports. Oh, I don't even want to see it. There are reports that it's a calf strain. And there's reports that he avoided something more serious. Jamar Chase also said he got one of those sup, nods, I'm okay, from Burrow after practice, so he thinks he's fine. Okay, <laughs> I'll buy into that, sure. Nervously, uh, it could have been worse. We all saw the sleeve on his leg there, and... I don't know if people are talking about this. It looks like he put pressure on his leg, that leg, as he hopped onto the cart. But no doubt about it, people, this is bummer city. This will almost certainly keep him off the field for an extent of time. And Collinsworth predicated his entire Super Bowl-bound Joe Burrow best year ever, finally get there and win it, argument on the basis that Joe Burrow is going to be available. I mean, the knee injury in 2021, the appendectomy in 2022, and now this. And to address Chris's point, and we have to, he's saying basically every advantage matters. There's no margin for error, especially in that conference, right? That division even. And yes, if you look at his numbers over the past two years in September up against the rest of the season, you can't argue it's the numbers, right? Burrow has been solid in the first month and still been in sort of a ramp up mode numbers wise because he's been significantly better by every measure over the final four months of the season. Now there could be tons of reasons for this. It might not have to do with even Joe Burrow. And you know, of course it didn't keep them from almost being there last year and it got them to the big game the year before that. So you can counter this right away by saying it's year four, Joe Burrow has the chemistry down, it's all fine. And that can be true or you can get sky is falling, nitty gritty, maybe baby, and suggest that had they come out hot last year, there wouldn't have been any coin flip drama and that title game is at home, yada, 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 what could have been. But I'm making the decision to not get carried away today, okay? Yes, the AFC is going to be so tight this year, even just the AFC North is woof. And those September games, are going to matter as the playoff seating shakes itself out in February. But here's what I'm about these days, people, okay? And I'm working hard to do it because it's not natural and it is not easy to me, but it is a choice to control your thoughts, to not think negatively, to not assume. We know nothing. And right now, I am choosing, as I am urging, encouraging, and willing you to hop on board with me and choose the Jamar Chase he's okay outlook on life, okay? It could have been worse. It's better that it happened now, a little thing, than a month from now. We don't have enough information, so let's just be about the positive vibes. That is my take on the Bengals. Uh, let me know what your thoughts are. Tell me that you're thinking positively about it or not if you're a Baltimore Ravens fan who has to say everything about the Bengals when I mention them. Okay, let's switch gears now and stay in the AFC. And are the Broncos a sleeper team? Well, they're certainly not being quiet right 
right now. Sean Payton had quite a day yesterday. So let's bring in my guy, Nick Cosmider, who covers the Broncos for the Athletic. Nick, coach, had some strong words yesterday for the um, the previous short-lived regime calling Nathaniel Hackett's 2022 20, one of the worst coaching jobs in the history of the NFL. That's an actual quote. Then he took shots at the Jets. I mean, Jeff Fisher somewhere like, hey, what about me? But what stood out to you? Yeah, I mean, you're right, Kay. Some of that stuff sounded as if it was uh, quotes coming out of an Onion article. Like, you're reading through it, and you're kind of rereading to be like, did he really say this? Like, let me make sure I'm reading these quotes right. Um, and the interesting thing is he had hinted at some of this early uh, in his tenure, like when he when he joined the Broncos in, in early February, um, you know, he had poked fun at the fact that their play clock uh, issues led to the crowd counting down the play clock in the home opener. He had called the film hard to watch. Um, you know, he, he had been pretty blunt about about what he thought of the previous regime, um, but he went ether in a whole new way, in a way that, you know, people around here were very surprised by in part because he also took shots at people who still work in that building. Um, definitely a tone that was set to start training camp that is different than what has been around here for, for quite a long time. Okay, so let's dig into that. What is the difference in tone? Sean has made it very clear that he wants to make big differences. He's implemented big changes. I think he's, you know, a reckless hothead pirate, you know, rage against the machine guy who's just rolling in there and likes to be in control of the organization. What's the biggest things that what are the biggest thing that things that you're noticing uh, as the change of regime takes place? Well, you, you kind of touched on it like it is a wholesale change in terms of the control that the head coach has. Um, and, and and part of that is because each of the last three head coaches the Broncos have hired since Gary Kubiak stepped down after the 2016 season were first time head coaches. Um, obviously, Vic Fangio is one of those. He'd been in the league a long time. Um, but still, when you become a head coach, it's a it's a new job. Um, and, and so for each of these years, you had people that were sort of still trying to figure out their voice in that particular role, trying to figure out how exactly they wanted to do the job, all while dealing with with issues the Broncos have had at quarterback, um, with the front office, with uh, general manager change, ownership change, just so much um, kind of always revolving uh, in in Denver. Mm -hmm. With Sean Payton, though, it is he knows how to do this. Okay, you know he has been doing it um, for 15 seasons, and and I think this new ownership group that was still trying to kind of find their way wanted somebody. Um, that would take full control and be kind of the voice, uh, a front-facing voice of the organization. And um, they certainly got that. A few interesting things before this even happened. I made the case on Wednesday that I think Hackett's a bigger deal than people are making in New York with the Jets and with Aaron Rodgers. And that'll be someone who sort of reels him in or like works really well with him, at least. And that matters when you have a quarterback who's as intelligent uh, and as demanding and knows what he wants as a guy like Rodgers. And so I had Melvin Gordon on to talk about the running backs and his Hackett experience. And he was telling me, um, and he was telling me that he, you know, he did not enjoy his experience in Denver. Obviously, the production on the field sort of reflected that, and uh, and he's moving on. But he made it about almost like the people Hackett brought in that were, you know, like Hackett was good, but the people he brought in maybe weren't as strong. He he mentioned, you know, if Hackett came into the running back room and he was able, I'm sorry, I'm oh, sorry, my producer saying something. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought he was. In, I thought I don't know what was happening. Um, he said that Hackett would come into the running back room and, and and explain it to them. They got it, and he left, and he did it. So he was kind of throwing some of the staff under the bus. They didn't make waves like Sean Payton did about Hackett and company. We also had T.J. Ward and Malik uh, Jackson on the show, and they were sort of talking about what will or what will not work out for uh, the 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 Sean Payton Russell Wilson experience. So I want to sort of get into your thoughts on that. Uh, not what happened last year. Like, let's not look too much in the, in the into the past, but it's got to just be run the ball and play action, right? Like, what's going to be the most important factor in making Russell Wilson Russell Wilson again? Yeah, I, I think that's that's where it starts, right? That they have to. They, they were um, 27th in the NFL last year in in rushing efficiency, um, and that was on top of 
uh, giving up a league high 63 sacks. Russell Wilson absorbed 55 of those in just 15 games. It was the most in his career. Um, so, so offensive line issues were a huge issue. They went out and spent 80 million yeah. guaranteed dollars on two offensive linemen, uh, which really shows you what they want to do. They, they want to be able to run the ball efficiently, and they also want to be able to get better uh, protection, uh, particularly in the interior of the line, um, to, to give to give Russell Wilson the time that he needs. But you saw in the last two games when Jerry Rossberg came in as the interim head coach, they had a lot more cogent plan on offense. They were committed to running the football, and they did, to your point, Kay, um, really bolster the, the play action game. The one thing I'm very curious about is Sean Payton's teams uh, in New Orleans are always in the top five, top six in time to throw. You get They get rid of the ball quickly. That leads to a low sack rate. Russell Wilson, um, time to throw is always 30th, 31st in the league, a, a high sack rate. And, and part of that is because he's able to escape, to make plays, to, to, to work off script. I'm very curious to see how how far Russell Wilson can come to Sean Payton's way of doing things. And that is three steps back foot, get the ball out quick passing game. And then we'll take, take our shots when we've softened up the defense a little bit more, as opposed to hunting those as a way to start our offensive scheme. I'm very curious to see how that's going to mix together. I don't know. TJ Ward told me you can't have Russell Wilson be, you can't Drew Brees, Russell Wilson. You can't make Russell Wilson something he isn't. You have to make him comfortable. And that, in my world, makes Javante Williams maybe the biggest factor in all of this. Obviously, helping with the offensive line, that figures everything out. But Russell's at his best historically when he has an impactful running game. Now, Javante's coming off a knee injury. Is he going to be full go by the start of the season? That is sort of the outlook right now. And we actually got to talk to Javante yesterday for the first time since he since he tore his knee in October. Um, and and he said that, that he, even he uh, was surprised by how quickly he got back when he tore his ACL. He had other ligament damage in that right knee as well uh, on October 2nd in a game against the Raiders. He he was told, hey, it's it's going to be a calendar year or more before you're able to be back on the field. And now here we are in, just inside of 10 months. And when they get out there here in just about 45 minutes, he's going to be, um, you know, full go. He, he said he's been cleared for contact. They will bring him along slowly. I think he'll have some load management days where he's a limited participant. Um, and and the, the preseason plan for him, I don't think, has been fully established just yet. But but I expect that he's going to be ready week one. And you're right. With what Sean Payton likes to do with his running backs, you're going to have two guys that go over 100, 100 carries this season. Samaj P. Mm-hmm. Ryan should be that other guy for, for the Broncos. Um, but Javante Williams, in his short time last year before he got hurt, really showed growth as a wide receiver or as a receiver out of the backfield and, and you know, split out wide. That is going to be a really interesting wrinkle of just how much they use him in that regard. And having Tim Patrick back is huge as well because he is a guy who uh, is a physical wide receiver in that running game. And, and he is also a guy that is just so reliable from a big third down kind of catch perspective. Um, so those two figures who they didn't have most of last year, I think – People don't realize how big they will be if they're in the in the lineup and healthy. I think it speaks volumes about what the team thinks about their health. The staff, Sean Payton himself, they, they weren't really after any of these, t- you know, available guys that are out there. Kareem Hunt still available. Dalvin Cook, of course, like, you know, flew to New York yesterday. But that's somebody that I would imagine Sean Payton would have been interested in. I think bolstering a running back group uh, that he might not have felt secure with. He likes running three guys. He did it over and over again. He likes putting everybody out there to do their thing, like you're saying. Uh, I think him not reaching and not bringing a guy in is indicative of how he feels about Javante Williams, his health, his availability, and that running back group. Just my thoughts, though. I'm not speaking for him. Okay, we got to go. Nick Cosmider, I appreciate you and uh, your work with The Athletic. Just enjoy enjoy the Sean Payton experience. Like, buy yourself some Jordan 11s, roll into camp, and just let it wash over you, you know? That's all you can do. Just embrace the ride for sure. I think it'll be super fun and sneaky good, too, over there, and at least interesting in Denver. Maybe I'll see you out there at training camp. Uh, we now welcome in a, a coworker of yours, a friend of the old virtual water cooler, Matt Schneidman, our good friend who covers the Packers uh, over at The Athletic. How have you been? Interesting week in Green Bay, to say the least. Yeah, I mean, Aaron Rodgers isn't here, so uh, I would argue it's very interesting still with Jordan Love. More importantly, I'm a four-time guest on Up and Adams. I could not be doing any better right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen, you just got out of Matt LaFleur's press conference. Any uh, any fireworks I need to know about? 
No, nothing interesting. They're going into a, a, a 50% jog through practice today since past two days have kind of been full go. So a pretty slow day here in Green Bay. What is post Aaron Rodgers Green Bay like? A lot of unknown. I've said, you know, this is my fifth season covering this team and there's always intrigue around the Packers. You know, they're one of the most iconic franchises in sports. But the question around this team the past four years and for the 10 years before that was, are they going to win the Super Bowl? Are they going to make that final jump from NFC number one or number two seed to hoisting the Lombardi trophy? This year, it's are they going to be any good? There's a lot more unknowns. They have two rookie tight ends who are going to be their top two tight ends. They have a quarterback who started one game and I believe thrown 83 passes in his NFL career. They have a wide receiver group whose most experienced receiver is 23-year-old Christian Watson. So many unknowns on this team. And nobody really knows what to expect, which is why I would argue it, it's more interesting this year than, than in any of the past four that I've been here for. Now, another unknown is this mustache. Is it staying? Is it part of like some sort Ooh. of uh, team bonding experience? What's going on there? <laughs> no, well, th this is a fake answer. I, I just kind of like how it looks. I'm probably wrong, but <laughs> Rogers always has his training camp mustache that he does this time of year. So someone's got to pick up the slack if he's not here because Jordan Love ain't growing a mustache. I can tell you that right now. He's too young to grow a full mustache, it seems. Uh, you miss Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll say this. I, I've said this to you before. You do. He is a reporter's dream to cover, not all the, <laughs> you know, extracurricular stuff. And listen, I love Pat McAfee and they've been great to me. You know, maybe sometimes we would rather go grocery shopping on a Tuesday than listen to an hour of COVID talk. But I digress. <laughs> he is so insightful. Uh, he's always been good to me. I wouldn't say I miss him, but it'll definitely be different covering Jordan Love, who so far hasn't really come out of his shell. You know, I don't blame him for that. Huh. He doesn't want to maybe show too much of his personality or come out and make any outlandish statements before he's really done anything in the league. He's very PC right now, uh, but we'll see if he kind of comes out of his shell and, and shows a little bit more of his personality if he starts winning games here. I don't care about his personality. Most <laughs> people hated Rogers' personality 50% of the time. Right. Talk to me about what the QB1 of the Packers looks like on the field. He looks good right now. You know, he, he's thrown a lot of dead ducks over the years on short passes, on long passes, just watching him uh, in practice during OTAs, mini camp, training camp over the past three years. His spiral's a lot more tighter. That may be a very mundane thing, but he's been okay the first two days. Matt LaFleur said the other day, the last thing he's going to do is overreact to one day. You know, Jordan Love had a couple deep balls underthrown against a pretty strong headwind. Matt LaFleur was not buying that as an excuse, but this is going to be a growing process. Nobody expects Jordan Love to come in and light the world on fire. Aaron Rodgers, the Packers, I should say, since QB wins aren't a stat. The Packers went 6-10 and 10 during Aaron <laughs> Rodgers' first season starting. He threw 13 interceptions in 2008, the most he ever threw in a season in his career. The Packers are built to win games other ways. They have arguably the best running back tandem in the league a top five offensive line who returns every single starter, a defense with eight first round picks. They don't need Jordan Love to be Superman this year, which I think is good because not too much is going to be required of him, which as you know, Aaron Rodgers was tasked with winning this team games by himself over the years. And the Packers don't really have to do that this year from that position. But but not last year. Aaron Rodgers was not winning games as much by himself yeah. yet last year. He was not his MVP self last year that's just true you can say for whatever reasons and the chemistry started building with you know the big tall number nine watson out there and company but there you know i like the the expectation isn't that he goes out there and has an mvp you know super bowl season uh like rogers had he doesn't have to at this point which is sort of nice for aaron Rodgers. even though i'm sure there has to be some sort of sentiment at locker room like he took a he gave back 35 mil why wouldn't he do that for us why wouldn't he do that here among these packer fans i'm wondering if you're hearing that in the locker room at all but i should have asked you this at the top when i brought you in with the hackett synergy here i don't know i'm being a bad host today and just completely let that go you're a perfect <laughs> person matt to ask about this you know, Sean's got these comments about Hackett. Everyone's sort of throwing him under the bus. It didn't work last year, as we all know. Russell Wilson looked the worst he's ever looked. Yada, yada, yada. He's back with the Jets. 
how much of an impact will he actually have? Salah is saying Rodgers will have creative control. He's got input. He's got he's part of the architecture. Like maybe sell me or tell explain to me how important or unimportant Hackett is going to be to the Jets' success. I said he's low key super pivotal. Chris Collinsworth Monday totally downplayed it. I wouldn't even say low key. I would say it's very high key. I remember back in 2020 when we were doing Zoom interviews during COVID. Nathaniel Hackett, his first head coaching interview was with the Atlanta Falcons, and we were on a Zoom with with Aaron Rodgers. And we asked him about Hackett's credentials for that job. And Rodgers kind of quipped at the end, I hope he doesn't go anywhere unless I do. And that was still kind of in the aftermath of, of, you know, Rodgers being a little peeved at the Jordan Love pick. What I learned about Aaron Rodgers is he'll probably flourish best if he's around people that he likes. I'm not saying he didn't like Matt LaFleur. I think he did. But – there were obviously some people in this building that Rodgers didn't like, and it led to some tension. Obviously, didn't affect the on-field results that much, but Aaron I Rodgers loved I want names. I want names. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's I pretty want clear. Names. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, it's I'm kidding. obvious that it's Brian Gutekunst. You know, Rodgers does not like him. And, you know, very quickly, when I talked to Rodgers a couple months ago for a story I wrote on kind of how uh, the marriage between he and the Packers fell apart, one of the lines he said that kind of made me sit back in my seat or perk up, I should say, uh, when Rodgers was talking about the lack of communication between him and Goody and kind of the whole thing of the FaceTime this offseason, he told me I talked to people that I like, and that was directly at the GM. So that was a whole nother thing. That We could talk for 20 minutes about that. But Hackett, he loves Hackett. You know, I went to Rodgers' press conference, his first one with the Jets, and saw Hackett there, and Hackett was sitting front row. And it's not just someone he likes. It's someone who knows him, someone who can accelerate this process of, okay, what are we going to put in this offense that works for Aaron? Two of his three MVP seasons here in Green Bay were with Nathaniel Hackett as his offensive coordinator. He's not just going to go into the Jets and take half a season uh, with an offensive coordinator who he doesn't know to get up to speed. He has an OC there who knows everything about him already. So it's not just on the personal side. It's on the football side as well, which – you know, Chris Collinsworth's a genius. He'll forget more football than I ever know. But I think it's high key, a huge part to why I think Rodgers is set up for success with the Jets this year. I agree. I think he's sort of a secret weapon that nobody's talking about until Sean Payton trashes him. And I would just say, yeah. I know that Sean, everyone's saying, or his the porters he talks to is whoever, whatever, are saying mm-hmm. if there's a plan, he's trying to probably motivate this team, new sheriff in town, all of that. Well, the stray that's being caught to hack it in this strategy is just going to incentivize and galvanize and add fuel to a Jets team that is excited, but probably going to start feeling pressure right about now. It doesn't hurt to be hearing crazy trash talk about your offensive coordinator. Yeah. If you're Aaron Rodgers, Garrett Wilson, Randall Cobb and Al Lazard, who know and are probably very friendly with Nathaniel Hackett. So it's, I would imagine it's like, uh, hey, thanks. Let's send, uh, let's send Sean Payton an edible arrangement later this afternoon for that beautiful uh, f- thing of fuel that we needed in the middle of training camp, you know? I think you're missing about six other former Packers who are on the Jets now. I think there's eight. <laughs> I know. I was saying, I was like, somebody asked me, what, what, you know, what are the Jets doing with that $35 million? I'm like, that's James Jones' salary. What do you mean? Like, that's what's going to happen. <laughs> Jordy Nelson's <laughs> on a listen, farm somewhere know, looking for an extra $10 yeah, million. I know you miss him. I will tell him you love him <laughs> and say hi, because I think I'm seeing him next week. Speaking of, to add insult to your injury, I thought you guys beat us all the time. Devin Hester's coming on the show today. Now, there's a guy who's probably faster than me. I'll tell you that. Yeah. I mean, this is a guy who I think is faster than Tyreek Hill. I said it, and he's on the show. No longer plays for the Bears. He also doesn't have a bust in Canton yet, which is the dumbest thing I've heard in a long time. So we're going to get to that. We appreciate you, Matt Steidman, and all your work over at The Athletic, the mustached one. We also, uh, we, we got to get out of here because we've got, you know, we were going to have Le'Veon Bell on the show, but big surprise, he canceled on me. Devin Hester is on the program after this on a Friday. Fantasy Bits, Fantasy Bits, it's time for Up and Adam's Fantasy Bits. Oh boy. I'll never do that again, I promise you guys. But today I want to talk to you about J.K. Dobbins, okay? I know he's had some injuries 
in the past, but I think he is being sorely undervalued right now. His ADP places him squarely in round four right now. Okay, he's gotta move up. What are we doing here? You can see he's ranked 18th at the running back spot. If he's able to stay healthy, I don't see why he can't perform much better than that and be a strong RB2 option, okay? When he's on the field, he was very special. He has RB1 potential, honestly. In 23 games, he's played, he has racked up almost 1,500 yards. He scored 12 touchdowns. He's averaged an NFL best 5.86 yards per carry since 2020. No one else is even close. It's more than half a yard more than the next closest player, Nick Chubb, every time he clutches the ball. Really think about that. He also put up over 100 total yards per game over the last five weeks when the knee was finally back to full strength. So he clearly hasn't lost a step after those knee injuries. And while we're hearing the Ravens are going to do their thing, they brought Odell and all that stuff and the receivers, they're gonna open up the passing game more. We're hearing that even Melvin Gordon said Monken wants to throw the ball a lot. Uh, I'm not that concerned. And it might just mean that there's more catches out there for JK for your PPR leagues. So the one thing to keep an eye on uh, would be his absence from training camp. He's not there. It sounds like it might be contract related, more that than an injury sort of situation. So I'm not gonna touch that right now because we do not know, but just keep your eyes on that situation. But if JK is ready to go, you can get a ton of bang for your buck by taking him in the late third, early fourth round. And he could be the, one of the bigger steals in your draft when it comes to running back depth because we value running backs on Up and Adams. So we value running backs in the fantasy football game. We also um, value training camp and they're in full swing and I just had to get into the action. I've always wanted to do like a mini tour. And by mini tour, like I wanna hit all 32. So it's impossible, lots of logistics, lots of, it's just been absolute madness, but we have sort of been pumping it up all week, getting options, hearing from you guys, and we've got some locations locked in for round one. This is, you know, this is the start of it at least, okay? So reveal the map, please. All eyes on Gang Green! We're there first Monday, July 31st next. Oh, is that an RV? We're going to Bill's Training Camp Turkey Burgers on Tuesday, then to the Commanders. Then we are going to check out the Eagles in South Philly after their Super Bowl appearance. And finally, we got the Day Ball Boys, the G-Men, the Giants. Okay, so let's, let's do the strength of schedule style, okay? We've got five games on the map so far cross country, so you're going on the road for a long time. We have a legendary quarterback right out the gate. So like, as for like, how do we get Rogers? How do we get through fans? How do we get through the HBO cameras? Like Rogers, come to me, come hang out with me. Then the bills, I mean, this is the longest leg of the road trip. So I think it'll test friendships between me and my producers. I've never been with them for longer than like 10 hours a piece. So this will be tough. I think we're getting in a sprinter van and driving to Rochester on something called a throughway. Also, crowd noise is gonna matter. Bill's never, you know, a, a place to go. You're gonna have to deal with a lot of adversity if you're trying to put on a show. Also, is Haley Steinfeld gonna be dressed better than me? A question I have. Then, we go to Washington. That'll be on Wednesday. I'm very excited, new vibes. Um, and we're gonna face a quarterback named Sam Howell who we don't have a lot of tape on. You know, we don't know what kind of defense to throw to. We don't know what he's gonna give us. So you gotta figure out how to game plan for a relatively unknown QB situation there. And then to a division rival. I mean, the Eagles might smell the commanders on us, right? They're gonna smell us that and we know that we're coming. And that's about as tough as an environment on the road as you can get there in Philly. And then there's of course having to make decisions, which I'm terrible at, like which cheesesteak is the cheesesteak. Do I skip the cheesesteak altogether? I need help. You guys have to let me know at Up and Adam Show. would love to meet some of you guys out there at NovaCare. And wrapping it up, we're gonna go back to New York, but we're not wrapping it up. I don't think I'm done. I don't think this is enough. But we're gonna go back to the Meadowlands, which I actually think is like a perfect little reprieve. They're not as hyped up as the Jets. It'll be probably a little more settled. They're more old school. They're old money kind of vibes. And we can just watch great football, check out Saquon Barkley's quads, and probably keep an eye out on celebrities. Like, are we gonna see Vito from The Sopranos? Bobby Bacala, who I saw at the Knicks game that one time? You just never know. Giants camp is where a lot of guys go and uh, women go that are celebrities of these teams. Okay, so who am I taking with me? Um, 
Hamilton has to go. <laughs> so Hamilton's going, and poor Marissa McBride is going to have to be elbowing, you know, communications people and people from local radio to try to get us some of these guys. But basically, it's the three of us in a sprinter van on dead stop traffic on something called a throughway. Marissa, are you excited? I'm so excited. A little nervous, yes. Optimistically happy, yeah, I think so cautiously optimistic. I think it'll be fun. I'm wondering who's gonna get the aux cord though for the first leg of the trip. That is what I'm really wondering. Oh God, well, we're taking a flight from LA. Hamilton, we're meeting you at Jets camp. It's a crazy way to start is to go into the jet situation where everybody wants to be a part of it. We have to, I'm thinking water balloons, I'm thinking ice cream truck, I'm thinking like have somebody come with some sage or something for Aaron, like let's bring adaptogens and just hand them out, like let's just hand out mushrooms to everybody. <laughs> This is the thing. I already know. Like, I'm going to have to spend, like, half of this trip babysitting and, like, keeping you under control because you're just going to get in these environments and just run wild. I'll leave the ox cord to you. Marissa is the secret weapon. Hamilton, you're great. I'm fine. Whatever. Marissa is not a person who will be told no. no. Like, Marissa is going to, we're going to be with the fans. We've got some presents for any fans, any of the camps oh, yeah. that we're going to and headed out to. We want to meet you guys. We're <laughs> excited to see these players and really just celebrate what it is. But I take on this sort of, like, little sister vibe, and I'm like, Marissa, what can we do for them? Like, well, I want, like, a concession table, and I want airheads and nerds, and I just want the players to come over and, like, have a little snack and some, like, a, a Capri Sun with us every day. It's going to be a smorgasbord for sure. We've got we've got some tricks up our sleeve. I'm excited to reveal them yeah. every day. I think the players are going to love them. I think the fans are going to love them. We're going to get them all incorporated. I think this is going to be a pretty good rollout for, of leg one, tentative leg one. And and Kay, you bring up a good point. Mar Marissa on these road shows is one of is, is a spectacle in and of itself. <laughs> uh, at the draft, that sprint. When, oh. when uh, they were doing the sound check <laughs> no. for uh, Motley Crue behind us, uh, uh, yeah. Jackson Smith and Jigba uh, was was blown away by her by her forty time <laughs> getting to that. Uh, yeah. That was Getting the fastest I've run to stop it. since high school. That was the fastest I have run I since, my four, since my four by one in high school, for sure. I looked across the fountain at the draft in Kansas City. Marissa's, they're doing a sound check. It's so loud. We can't hear anything. We're about to, we're, we're interviewing, um, uh, 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 what can I think of it? Rich Paul mm -hmm. and we from Clutch Sports and, and, and Marissa's sprinting. And all of a sudden in the back, I see two souls just go into the air and she ended the lives of two poor people working for Motley Crue with whatever she did, respectfully, with love. With love. With love she did that. And That's the love. other thing, Hamilton, will be, to wrap this up, Marissa in Philadelphia, which is just, oh. you know. I'm coming oh, home. Boy. I don't know if I can handle that. Oh, it's gonna be great. <laughs> we'll do it, we'll get some Philly love. I'll show you the ropes. Nothing to be scared of. Just a nice little Philadelphian welcome. That's all. <laughs> Uh, okay, but I here's, heard here's go also the deal. hundred times during Super Bowl week. I, I don't know if I can take any more. <laughs> well, also, I mean, who's going to handle Marissa's media availability? That's on you, Hamilton. I'm not doing it. Marissa does interviews. True. I can't be doing this again. I can't be going on Fox 29 again. Nope, no, nope. <laughs> can't do it. Can't don't do get it. me started on Fox 29 either. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, want, I want Aaron Rodgers. I want Josh Allen. I want, I need to know the Sam Howell guy. We got to check in with our guy from the draft we hung out with in Chase Young. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we can talk to Coach Rivera about the new vibes. I'm just so excited to see what Washington's all about. I've never been to their training camp. I've never been to yeah. a single game down there. So I'm super looking forward to that. But we're not done because I just think we're doing like three NFC East teams. It just made the most sense. Yeah. I think it's a starting point. A starting point <laughs> and because I'm thinking positively and I'm putting all this positive energy I just feel like on the way back there has to be some sort of like Cincinnati Nashville LA or like Cincinnati Denver <laughs> LA Chargers done something there needs to be we can't just do like New York back I just don't I don't believe in that I like the Denver Richard little just said I think we could oh he did Denver I like the little Denver yeah. route. I like the I like the Tennessee angle. I want to go to Cincinnati. Never been there. Chargers are down the street. I I think those are great additions to the tentative leg too. But I want more. 
Bring it on. I want more. I want more. What, which, which, <laughs> what is the best? Well, here's the thing. The flights are brutal. The flights from Cincinnati, <laughs> LA, that's all brutal. Everybody tell us where we should go on mm-hmm. our way back. One or two cities. And then I think I've blown out the, ble- the budget till 2026. 20, <laughs> so we're going to take a break here. We're trying to get Devin Hester. Are you guys lying about Devin Hester? Is he coming on? Do we know? Are we getting Devin Hester? Oh no, we're not. They're not telling me. Oh no, I hope we get him. Ah! All right, back on Up and Adams, trying to get to Devin Hester. He's in a car. We're trying to see if we can get him uh, on because I would freak out if I ever got to talk to him. But I mean, year number two passed up for the Hall of Fame. It makes no sense. The Hall of Fame, respectfully, with love, what are we doing? 20 career total touchdowns, most all time. I knew in 2006, after that first touchdown against, I think it was the Packers, if I remember correctly, it was like an 84-yarder. He should have been, no, leave this up there. I need to read through that. Can we put that up there again? He should have been in the Hall of Fame after that, okay? What he did, that Bears team, Rex Grossman, Jay Cutler, not much to watch or be excited about. I'm a Chicago girl, born, bred, raised. 14 career punt returns, most all time. Two kickoff return touchdowns in one game, most tied for most all time. And all those punt ret- return yards, third all time. The Hall of Fame is supposed to be the best players from all the positions in the NFL. There are kickers in the NFL. Special teams is part of it. And I would, this is no shade to Cutler. Well, you know how I feel about Cutler on this show. No shade to him or Sexy Rexy, but you put him on another offense with another quarterback, maybe those receiving numbers, those rece- the whole receiving situation is a little bit different from Mr. Hester. I want to talk to him about that. I want to talk to him about Tyree Kill, his son, things he does in the community, what he thinks about this year's Chicago Bears, all of that and more and hopefully we get him after this if not you're gonna see a nice little tap dance by k adams you better get up out my way catch your fade he's gonna take it all the way devin hester has done it again for chicago and he is unbelievable every time we watch him he's scoring where do you kick it here he goes it's hester hester's gonna take it <laughs> My favorite is when he's looking at the scoreboard. There's so many plays where he turns around and starts waving. He had it all going on. He revolutionized the game, a game changer, and gave me, a, a young gal from the northwest side of Chicago whose parents were immigrants from Poland and didn't even know anything about American football, he gave me something to get on my couch and jump up and down about every Sunday afternoon. Oh my goodness, I'm so excited to welcome our next guest, 11-year NFL veteran, four Pro Bowls, three All-Pros, future Hall of Famer, the greatest punt and kick returner in the history of the NFL and an absolute legend. Hi, Devin Hester. How you doing? Pretty good. I hope all is well with you guys. Yes, I'm so great. I'm so uh, glad to talk to you. I know you're in your car. Thank you for trying to make all of this happen. I love seeing your highlights, and we're going to dig into some of those in a bit. We'll talk some bears. But first, um, you know, we're going to talk about the Hall of Fame situation. That's fine. But somebody who's going to get into the Hall of Fame is your son, okay? Your son, Drayton, a.k.a. (laughs) Ankle Bully, he will be in Canton with some of these highlights. Look at these. Take me through some of these. Oh, okay. That was the game last week he played against a um, uh, uh, part one of the team called uh, Mapaka. And um, that was a game last week, pretty much like the first game of the season for those guys uh, coming out for our league, which is Florida League. Well, amazing. He is so incredible. I saw Roddy White was commenting. There, there were like a thousand likes or more than that even on this video. He is crushing it out there like father, like son, of course. And I want to talk about some of um, some issues, but I can't, you know, the pain it causes me as a Chicago girl t- that you're not in the Hall of Fame. We can't move past it. I can't move past it. What are your thoughts today yeah. on that? Uh... You know, I talked to a lot of veteran guys, uh, a lot of guys that's in the Hall of Fame, and um, they're like, you know, keep your head up, don't be, don't get so frustrated, um, because it, 
the minute you get that call, it's going to feel like it was a first ballot, man. You're just going to be so relieved, man. You know, we all know that it's, it's bound to happen. You know, it's just a matter of time with me. And, um, you know, I just got to stay positive. Don't think negative about the situation. Um, it's out of my control, to be honest with you. Um, but at the end of the day, we all know as football analysts and as great players that I should be in by now, but the time will come. And you will get in. Is there a reason that you've thought of, you know, we can look at your resume here. Is there something that, like, if you were to answer the question, why aren't you in? Like, why aren't you in these two years? What's the reason? I think it's uh, from, from just talking to the high guys above um, that know more than anybody about the Hall of Fame situation. It's, 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 mm -hmm. For me, they was pretty much saying this is a hard, the hardest thing for those guys to evaluate. Um, First off, just special team wise, is is what's hindering the situation. Um, they just don't know how to quote unquote um figure out how special team will play a part in the Hall of Fame. Um I do know that uh, when they do pick five guys each year, the last two years I was the sixth guy to get cut. So I was the last hmm. of the crop two years in okay. a row um to get cut. And it's just, it's one of them, them, them unique situations where I'm listed as a special team guy and a returner. So it's so hard right now for those guys to figure this out of how to get a special team guy now. But they know that um, sooner or later I will be in. Wow. See, I hear that. And just as a fan of yours, I'm thinking, okay, well, kickers are in there. Ray Guy is in there. Why not a return right. specialist? You're being docked because you changed the game and there was nobody like you before you or after you. It doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't. It doesn't at all. You know, and I, I did get frustrated the first year. The second year, you know, it was I was kind of used to the situation and the situation that I was in. And uh, it didn't hurt as bad the second year. But first year, I did cry. I'm going to be honest with you. I was very upset because um, mm. as a player, you know, I mean, not just looking at special team wise, but what I did to the game and how I changed the game. You know what I mean? From the aspect of uh, special team wise. And unfortunately, wasn't able to be a first ballot. That's something that I really wanted. You know what I mean? As my career got going and I started doing some things that never was done before, I looked at it as, you know, hopefully I can be a first ballot. And that's what I, I worked so hard for for as a as a player. Um, my rookie, second year, third year, on up to my last year in the league, I really, really wanted to be a first ballot. And um, unfortunately, it didn't, it didn't pan out the way I wanted it to. But at the end of the day, you know, all things worked out for the good. And hopefully I'll be in soon. Oh, my gosh. I, you cried after you didn't make it the first year. And now you're just sort of settled yeah. and you're thinking positive. I am in the church of Devin Hester this morning. That is an incredible way to carry <laughs> yourself and an incredible, honestly, an outlook on life. I was thinking this morning about this with how explosive, how dynamic you were out there on the field. There's so much more creativity in the NFL right now offensively. What does Devin Hester look like? in a Debo Samuel-esque role in today's NFL? Oh, that's... <laughs> I, I, people, people that know me and the coaches that know me know that if I was in a system where I was playing with Patrick Mahomes or I was playing with the 49ers mm -hmm. right now with the offense scheme that those guys have, that I would, write, I would be right there with those guys when it comes down to performance and and the way they play and the way they're utilized. I think I fit that type of skill. Um, I can always line up at running back. I played running back my whole high school, part one of years, you know, so that's not a question of me running the ball. Um, you can see a glimpse of that University of Miami where I did both ways on the ball, offense, receiver, throwing the ball, even running the ball, catching the ball. So in an offense like that, man, sky's the limit for me, man. That's why I always tell my friends that, you know what I mean, I feel like I unachieved. You know what I mean? My career in the NFL, because there's so much I could have did, but it wasn't shown. So you, the fact that you're saying you underachieved is crazy, but I look at a guy like Tyree Kill, a guy who looks up to you. Tyree Kill, you know, he was comparing himself to you back in 2016 before he even had a game, He before he even was out there for training camp, and then you see what he was able to do, you know, with that speed. But I heard you're, you're faster than Tyreek, huh? You would have beat Tyreek in a race? Uh, 
Tyree, Tyree, I look at more. He 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 probably would have got me on the track. I think um when it comes to me, when me and him get compared, I think I can my change of direction is faster than his. I I would say his straight ahead line speed, he probably has me, but on the field change of direction, I think my moves and his moves, I, I don't lose speed. And sometimes he may lose lose a slow down a little bit, making a move, but I think that's where I get him when it comes to football. Uh, speed is I, I my change of direction was something that I worked on and I craft, you know what I mean, since I was young. So I was able to make moves and not lose speed. And that's where I feel like I can get them at on the field. Mm. Now, everybody talks about the iconic play by you, like that, you know, and you had a one, one really good receiving year, but I think too, I think if it wasn't Rexman or a uh, Grossman, Rexman, Rex Grossman, if it wasn't Cutler, if it was a different world, a different system, that your numbers would have been bigger and you would have made more of an impact in the receiving game. I think that's so true. But you were iconic, and I mean, you you know this. It's nothing I'm new telling you. Everybody always, of course, talks about what happened against Indy, the Super Bowl. It's never happened since. It never happened before. Do you have a favorite play, though? I'm sure you're sick of seeing that one. What's your Hall of Fame-worthy play, like your favorite thing you ever did out there on the field? Um, If I had to, the, to, to, to pick one, of course, it would be Andy, but... My, I always say that my, my favorite moment was when we played Arizona, Arizona Cardinals, my rookie year. Oh, and yeah. And I believe we was down, we was down like 20 something. 80 plus. Zip. There you go. Talk yeah, me through we was this. down like 20 something. So this was a game where, you know what I mean, our defense was playing lights out um, the whole year. And um, pretty much our defense was carrying our team. Uh, well, it's a special team. I had a couple returns before this game. And uh, we just couldn't get nothing going on the offense. And Arizona jumped out on us like 20 sun zip in the hat. 20 sun, like 24, 2 or 24, 3 at halftime. Mm -hmm. And we found a way, defense found a way to come back. And they put up like, kind of put the game in reach. And then for it to come down to the situation where um, I had the opportunity to get my hands on the ball and take the point back to uh, to put a, give us the lead to win this game. And I think that right there really <laughs> solidified uh, the type of player I was. Yeah, there's year. that one. There's your return. There's your your return against the Giants was my favorite. I just yeah. love that the Jay Feely <laughs> kick. You were, I was just like, oh my god. Yeah. There's so many plays. I love your first touchdown, 2006, up against the Packers. I know them all. But now the yeah. NFL's different. It's changed a little bit. So you know, not that there ever would be another you anyway. But the rule changes are making sure that there's no more Devin Hester out there. There's a new rule that you can signal for a fair catch anywhere inside the 25-yard line, and the ball will be placed at the 25-yard line. What's wrong with the current NFL? I mean, I I disagree with it because then now you take players like me out of the game. Um, does it benefit me in a selfish way? Yes, because then now you could possibly find the next Devin Hester that, that, that takes over the return game. Um, but mm -hmm. as, as a player myself, like, I don't want a kid that comes around with that, the type of talent that I have to be short of play, be an opportunity to play in the NFL because of they're taking the rules, they're taking the, the kicks and the punts out of the league. Mm. One last one for you quick. We're running up against the clock and we thank you, Devin Hester. I'm going to ask you these Chicago no bears, you got Justin Fields, you got DJ Moore. You are an absolute legend. The 2023 bears will dot, 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 finish the sentence. Make it to the playoffs. What? Why? How? What? <laughs> they will. I think they will make it to the playoffs. Okay, I, that's I that's all I needed from you. They will make it to the playoffs. Devin Hester, if you were ever in LA, I would love to meet you in person and go through all of your plays. It would take us 20 hours. A future Hall of Famer, an icon, a legend. We'll see you guys next week. Have a good weekend, Devin Hester. Thank you.